Hey, everyone hear me okay? Brilliant, thanks. Well, thank you very much for inviting me here. Just gonna open this water away from my laptop. Be a good idea. Yeah, lovely to be back in Berlin and to see so many people here. Um, yeah, um, I'll just, one second. Thank you. I'll just jump straight into it. Uh, my name is uh, Chris Lamb. I am um, from Cambridge, um, not, um, not this Cambridge. They've been in the news recently. I'm from uh, this Cambridge, which never looks like this, by the way. For about one day a year, it's this sunny. Um, yeah, but uh, it can do, you know, and go punting if you have not been. It's very, very nice. Um, but I tend to, um, I, I live in London these days, which is a bit, bit drearier and uh, less photoshopped than this picture. Um, I've been the Debian project leader since um, early 2017, um, recently re-elected by second term. I'm on the uh, board of directors of the Open Source Initiative, um, which are sponsoring this event, just throwing it out there, and uh, giving another talk on that tomorrow. Um, been a free software developer in my spare time for ooh, 10 years, I think now. Um, got into it, sort of fell into it, and. Um, found myself with too much spare time at university, usual, usual thing. And, and now I'm a freelancer. I was in the um, London startup scene for quite a few years. And uh, then I went freelance probably about four or five years ago. And I'm really enjoying it, mostly doing open source work um, and things like that. It's, it's really, really great, just stuff like that. Um, I, for example, I do a bunch of weird hacks. So for example, here's a Sudoku solver that in PostScript. So actually, if you print it to a real PostScript printer, the printer itself will solve it, um, doing all the correct backtracking of, of um, et cetera. Um, or if you render it to a PDF, your PDF renderer will do it for you. But yeah, just kind of stupid stuff like this. Oh, someone once asked, once asked on IRC, can you get CP to give a progress bar like wget? Well, they were probably asking quite sensibly, but yeah, you can if you S trace the CP and, and then, yeah, so you can kind of see it going there, yeah. Don't, don't use this, don't use this. Oh, and I also made an operating system that plays hackers on repeat, because um, why not? Good for public kiosks. Just put in the USB stick, let it boot once, and it will play hackers on repeat, because why not? Yeah. Okay. Oh, in my um, spare time, whatever that is, I sort of pretend to be a classical musician. Um, that's a lute and a viola de gamba. Anyway, just there's more to me than computers, hopefully. Hopefully. So today I'd like to talk to you about um, three developers, you know, hypothetical developers, tell a story, they say, you know, um, that kind of thing. Um, so the first developer is Alice. And um, she releases a, she develops software on her, on her Mac. Uh, and it, my awesome software. And you can either download the source, or for convenience, you can download uh, pre-compiled binaries. Uh, so an EXE, a dev package, an RPM, or whatever, blah, blah, blah. Um, so this is free software. Uh, and the, uh, these executables are, are being uh, provided for, just for, com just for convenience, and just because it's just handy. Like, you know, if you're, if you're, for example, you're on Windows, to actually compile something is a bit of a pain. But even on, on, um, on free software operating systems, you just sometimes just I just want to install it. Just get it where. Okay, cool. This is great. Uh, and that goes swimmingly for a few years. And then, um, you know, uh, sometime, uh, one, one day, she just gets a knock on the door. And this chap turns up and says, oh, yeah, so those, um, uh, that source, just, just leave that exactly how it is. But before you make those EXEs or those DEBs or those RPMs, can you just, you know, make a few changes to them before... Um, before they go live, before you upload them, don't 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 push it to your GitHub or whatever you're hosting on now. Uh, but but you know, make these changes to the XEs, um, or you know, something might happen. You know, nice house you've got here, nice nice children you've got, nice nice life you've got. You know, but you know, we'll just keep this very quiet. You know, just yeah, just between us. Yeah. Not cool. Uh, and so she's sort of forced blackmailed into um, introducing changes into the source before generating these binaries. And as I say, the, the, her source on the GitHub remains entirely the same throughout. And so yeah, now, now, now the source and the EXEs don't correspond. In other words, if you built that source and ran the program, you'd be running a different program that did something different than if you were just downloading the EXEs and running them. 
which is not really that not that great. Second developer is Bob. Bob is um, highly computer literate, as you can tell by the um, rather elaborate keyboards, um, mechanical keyboards. Probably annoys all of his colleagues with their clickiness, you know, the kind of thing. Um, and has wooden headphones for some reason in the bottom left. Because <coughs> cough, hipster cough. Yeah, yeah. Um, he's a um, sysadmin for a large operating system and manages a whole bunch of um, servers and things like that in the, in the cloud or as data centers, as we used to call them. Um, unfortunately, he's not unaware that um, these data centers were, his personal computer was sort of broken into, it was targeted uh, and broken into. And so now all of the um, build servers that make part of, the, of that data center um, are, are compromised, and the compilers have been compromised in particular. So every time they generate code, if you, you even if you put good code into it, the binaries they generate have you know extras, you know, like, like before, like with Alice, you know, these, these sort of extra. Uh, let's, let's not call them backdoors. That's just far too strong. But uh, you know, they're basically backdoors, or or they're leaking privacy, or they're um, um, sending your your you know secret keys or um, Bitcoin passphrases, etc., to someone else. Basically, you haven't, nothing, uh, you, you don't miss happening. Yeah. Um, and this is a problem because those um, data centers are generating those, um, say, pre-compiled binaries, and they're being sent to users, and the users will then install them. So, you know, apt install, blah, and it goes and installs all these packages. And so uh, the user has no idea that the, the user's own machine has not been compromised until they install one of these, which has been compromised via compromising Bob, which is then being able to compromise the compilers. And as I say, the, the source code that are going into the, into the build farm is still completely legitimate. If you looked at it, you can analyze it for, for any malicious flaws. There's nothing there. But the um, end users, you or me, are still being, are running code that isn't code that you don't want to run. Um, our last developer is Carol. So um, this is actually not Carol because, um, well, that's Eve. And um, so Carol's just sitting in her um, uh, hotel and um, Eve is one of these evil maid attacks that you hear about. So has installed a backdoor on, um, on, on Carol's laptop. So every time now Carol distributes software to her friends, you know, like a good free software citizen, um, the, this, the, it's also been compromised or revealing privacy or root kits, et cetera. Who knows? Who knows? Who knows? Which is a bit of a problem uh, if she's a good free software citizen because um, freedom, freedom 2, being the third freedom on the list, um, freedom to read your copies so you can help your neighbor. Now, we all know what that kind of means in the technical sense, but are you really helping your neighbor if you're giving them a rootkit? Oh, well, uh, I probably wouldn't stretch. That's a bit of a, a wider definition than the FSF and RMS were after but I don't think you're really helping your neighbor if you're infecting their computer with malware. I don't know, call me old fashioned. <laughs> yeah. So what's, what's the general problem here I'm outlining with these few developers? So you can view the source code for malicious software for flaws, um, you can you know, download the code for Nginx, look through it, you can hire someone to look through it for you, you can, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. You can you know, analyze it, you can throw it through static analyzers, you can do all these kind of extra checks. For all sorts of things that have been stuck into your um, in, into the original source code, but most users are installing pre-compiled binaries because you just don't have time to compile. You know, Gen two was a little while ago now, right? It's still around, but you know, yeah, um, whatever. Uh, yeah, so most people are installing pre-compiled binaries on servers, on their laptops, and stuff. Particularly if, when you're doing the initial install, there's all binaries because what are you going to do? You're going to bootstrap, okay, whatever. And so basically, are we trusting this compilation process? Can we trust that the binaries correspond to the original source code? It's a big question. Um, if anything gets in between and interferes with that process, you can't trust those binaries being run at the end. Big problem, big problem and one that we've been sort of blind to for years. I mean, we can, as I say, we're doing a lot of work to find um, malicious vulnerabilities. It is in ones deliberately added to the source code and ones that were inadvertently added, you know, just raw bugs. Raw bugs, just normal bugs in the source code. 
But um, if we just can't trust that our compilers are doing what they want as well, or they build farms, et cetera, et cetera, then this is a problem and security is only as strong as your weakest link, et cetera. And this is a big problem because in the real world, um, f things get attacked. So there was, uh, this is a little while ago now, 2010, um, kernel the org was hacked, uh, Hatchy, FreeBSD, um, other things as well, blah, blah, blah. I'll go through quite a few of these, blah, 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 evil may. So basically, this, this actually happens. And these are the ones we know about because most of these people on those screenshots were kind of people who might disclose that it's happened. Maybe some companies would just keep it very quiet. So who knows? Um, this, this, so basically, this stuff happens in the real world. So what's the solution? So solution is, well, you know, first we all start with the same source. So we basically agree that um, this is the source code for Apache. Great, OK, brilliant. Then we ensure that the build always produces the same result. And by the same result, I mean an identical result. I mean a bit-for-bit -bit identical result. So every time um, I build a piece of software or you build Apache, um, we get end up with the exact same binary, as in we run um, SHA-1 some, we run MD5 some, we run, basically we do a bit-for-bit -bit comparison between the two um, end up binaries, and we ensure it's always the same in whatever environment we build in, whether I build on my own laptop, on your laptop, in the build farm, things like that. So we always get the same result if we build from the same source. And then we basically compare results. So let me just run through this a bit. So David, he builds, say, the Apache binary. And um, just for convenience, we'll use SHA-1 sum. Um, he generates a binary with this particular checksum there. Um, then Erin builds the Apache binary and ends up with this checksum here. OK, cool, they match. OK, so we, and we pretty much we agree we start with the same source. So um, you know, OK, great. Then Fred builds. And Fred says, well, hang on, guys. Um, I, I'm ending up with a different checksum here. Um, but I've started with the same source. Well, from this, we can determine that there's something up with Fred's tool chain, uh, or c compiler, or library that he's using, or his machine, or his compiler. Something in there is in making sure that he's ending up with a different result. And you know, this could be malicious. His computer may be hacked. His, um, the build farm that generated his compiler could be hacked. Who knows? We, this doesn't tell you what the actual issue is, but it tells you there's an issue, which is much, much better than where we are at the moment, where pretty much everyone's getting a different hash, and who knows, you know, whatever. Yeah, whatever. Um, so the other thing here is that either David and Aaron have, sorry, either Fred's been hacked, been compromised, etc., or both David and Aaron have been hacked. OK, you don't know, you know which is the, 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 the proper um, hash you should be getting. No one can, there's no answer to that. But if you have enough people in this web, and they all pretty much agree that the hash is, say, the 7A482B, whatever, then you can start to come to sort of consensus saying, Do you know what, if you build Apache, this particular version of Apache, um, you end up with this hash. And you should end up with that hash if you don't look into things and see what's going on. So yeah, um, how would this help our developers? So the, um, the blackmail will be uncovered. So a bunch of people would download the original untampered source code and generate the EXE and perhaps compare that with the website, uh, the, webs the website's version of that EXE, and say, why is your EXE different, Alice? And sh she would be sort of have to answer some uncomfortable questions about why that happens. Um, Bob, the compromise of the servers would be detected because a whole bunch of people in that distribution would, for example, rebuild a piece of software and say, hmm, Bob, um, w I see that your build farm generated the Apache binary with checksum A, but when I build it on my own machine, I get checksum B. And if I build it on my, you know, my spare laptop, I also get checksum B. It doesn't match. What's the deal? Is it me? Is it you? Start an investigation, see what's going on. Carol, her laptop will also detect it. So if anyone rebuilds the software that she's giving out to friends, um, it'll, it won't match the, the, the hash sums or the check sums. Um, it just won't match. And so they'll be like, well, you know, what's going on? I think, thinks, Carol, I think there's something up with your laptop. You know, you might want to check that out. So it will flag up these issues. And this basically reduces the incentives to attack in the first place. I think one, I'm no expert blackmailer, but I pretty much I'm under the impression that 
you probably don't want to blackmail someone if you're going to be uncovered because you know the whole idea that it's it's, it's private it's secret it's surreptitious and so in, in this case uh, there'd be no point going after carol no point in threatening her family or her house her dog cat um uh, w with you know something bad if if the, your blackmail is just going to be uncovered a few weeks later when someone rebuilds on the website and says alice you've been compromised oh okay yeah sorry and so when i said reproducible builds and i has identical results i don't necessarily mean reproducible in the sense of it builds with the same dependencies or that it's a reliable build. So people often use this, say, in the JavaScript world, where, oh, by reproducible, I just mean that you get, you know, every time you build, it uses the, the same versions of, of whatever dependency chain, et cetera, like that. Or it doesn't use the internet to build. Um, I mean literally identical build results. So, like, it literally is, SHA-1 would be the same, MD5 would be the same. If you use the CMP tool that actually does the byte for byte comparison, it's, yeah. But wait, isn't software reproducible already? I mean, this is what I thought. Um, someone told me this, introduced me to reproducible builds in a pub. And I said, yeah, but every time you build, surely if you just press up and enter again when you build, you just get the same result because computers aren't magic. This is just how they work. But no, I, I went home and built a piece of software and then built it again. And um, I got a different result. And this was, this was really ugly, you know, just ugh, ugh. So yeah, so um, why isn't software reproducible right now? I mean, there's lots of reasons. Uh, one big reason is that as part of build processes, there's quite a lot of non-deterministic activity. So if your build process iterates over any kind of non-deterministic data structure, and the results of that end up in the final binary, your software won't be reproducible. Um, for example, a Perl hash, if you iterate over the keys, that's not defined to be in any particular order um, by default, unless you add a sort into it, for example. And if your build process is, uses one of those um, uh, data structures, and because of that, it you know, puts some things in different orders or in, in different files in different places, which usually wouldn't matter, presumably otherwise it'd be a bug already. But um, if that happens as part of your build process, then your software will not have an identical build result every time you build it, and therefore it won't be reproducible. And therefore you won't be able to do the, um, the comparison hashes between uh, Fred, Aaron, et cetera, et cetera, because you won't, can't have this guarantee that you should always get the same result. So therefore when you don't get the same result, you, you can start to flag up. So yeah, dictionary hash database ordering, you know, basically any non-deterministic ordering. Um, parallelism in builds, so uh, you know, multi CPUs been around for a while. I think my phone even has eight CPUs or something bizarre. Um, but basically, if your build process has parallelism such that um, the results come in, in in different orders, but just because you know this CPU happened to finish first this time, or etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, this thread is a bit faster than this one this time. If that means that the binary ends up with a different result at the end due to that build parallelism, so for example, whichever one wins, it gets added to a file first, just for example, uh, then your, again, your build will not be reproducible. Timestamps, this is perhaps the biggest bugbear. Uh, software just loves, as part of the build process, to add a timestamp. I was built on this day. Oh. Um, great, but it means that if you build it on a different day, or a different time, or a different time zone, or yeah, if you build it in the future, if you build it in the past, um, it will not end up with the same result, and therefore it will end up with a different hash, and so you can't play this, the, the, the checksum comparison, comparison game. Build paths, another one, quite nefarious. So as part of, um, well, let me give you one example. Um, C++ assertions, um, when they fail, they include the say, oh, I, uh, this assertion failed in this line of code on this particular line, um, etc. in this particular file. Great, very useful to debugging. Unfortunately, it likes to encode the actual build path. So our file I built in my home directory, so, you know, slash home, slash Lambie, and you built in, you know, slash home, slash Christelle or whatever, um, it would end up with a different binary between us because mine binary would say Lambie in it somewhere and yours would say Christelle in it. You know, it'd be basically saying the same thing, 
But because we built on our own separate machines and the binary ended up with the um, with our particular usernames in them, won't be reproducible between builds. And so therefore, we can't play the, uh, we'll have a different hash, etc. And so we, can, again, can't play the hash comparison game. Non-deterministic file ordering. By this, I mean that um, a Unix file system is not actually um, defined to um, return files in a sorted order. When you do an LS, that's actually LS sorting them for you. Um, so if you do um, the underlying read uh, system call, it is not, it's provided them in any order it likes. In, ext, in the ext file systems, that usually ends up with the same ordering each time you do it. Not and for ext, generally in the order you added them to the directory, but that's not guaranteed. Um, other file systems can, will, and sometimes are completely valid to return directory items in when you ask for them in any order it likes. Yeah, it's good to be implementation agnostic. But this means that any build process that does a naive read call, and for example, concatenates all these text files into one, uh, and it relies on the underlying file system's ordering of these files, is going to be non-deterministic. And so if I built it once, and then you built it once, we may end up with a different result. Dot, 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 we can't play the hash comparison game. So you often just need to have a bit of sorting to ensure that it's always the same each time. And all sorts of other stuff. Um, users, groups, UMART environment variables. So not only do we have uh, build processes saying, I was built at this particular time, you have them saying, I was built on the 486 machine. Great. And my machine is called you know, Keyboard Cat or whatever it is called. Great. That's not actually that very useful. And it means that if you build on a machine that's not that, you end up with a different result. Not good. Can't play the game. But are there any other advantages for reproducible builds? turns out there are. Uh, one great thing is that if you do make a deliberate change to a source code, you should see a resultant change in the output binaries. But as, you're, as you've removed all this non-determinism, all the other changes that might just happen as part of rebuilding once, uh, building twice, should I say, as you've removed those as part of having a generally reproducible build, when you do make changes, the actual deliberate changes that you've made should be the only changes you see in that binary. So if you just change one particular conditional from a, uh, you know, you re replace a, uh, an if conditional with an if not conditional, you should just see that tiny change in the final code. You know, and if you don't, that means that something else is screwed up, which is great. So you just get minimal diffs, minimal binary diffs, and, mean and minimal meaningful diffs as well on the deliberate changes you're making to source code. Um, you also get a better cache hit ratio if your um, your dependency chain uh, is you know you as part of a build you're building all these sorts of extra things before if you didn't have a reproducible build then because the timestamp has changed it's going to have to rebuild all this other stuff which means you have to rebuild all this other stuff and then blah blah blah, blah. but if your build is reproducible it should always be the same you're going to get a better cache hit ratio on these prerequisites for your current build which saves time money CO2. Um, you know, because you're not like burning through the atmosphere just to build something with a slightly different timestamp. Um, you can also use this to remove build dependencies. Again, when you have minimal diffs, um, if you remove a build dependency or you build it, an environment without a particular um, library and you end up with the exact same result binary at the end, well, it probably means that you aren't needing that particular build dependency, so you can remove it from your build chain, which may, again, save on build time, etc., or installation, and just having a minimal set of build dependencies is always kind of just kind of nice and clean. It also can find bugs. Um, let me just run through some examples. So as a security bug I found, um, there was a particular um, piece of software that during the build process, it would generate a configuration file, a default configuration file. And um, it would do this by um, using the RAND function and uh, being like, okay, great, in the build, um, store something called an open ID consumer secret um, using a random, let's just assume that's like secure. That's like, whatever, just remember that. And this ended up on your file system at user share Perl fiber or a problem data PM. There like that. But so, so anyone who installs this build will end up with the same secret. Every time you built it, you got a different secret because every time you built it, the build.pl file was being run. 
but it means that anyone who shares that particular binary of this, the end up resulting build will end up with the same secret. And I'm no security expert, but I reckon that's not very secure when everyone has the same one and I know what yours is. Yeah, it's not that cool. Um, it also finds other weird bugs that aren't security ones. So here was a very odd bug in a man page generator. What was happening is that sometimes when you ran it, instead of saying, for example, this manual page documents the usage of Wikipedia FS, it would say usage of Wikipedia FS. So what? You looked at the original, um, uh, original text for this, and it would just say the usage of Wikipedia FS. And you're like, Why, where is this extra O? coming from? Well, um, someone cra um, uh, tracked it down, and it was in this memcopy call. And we, great. Um, and we look it up, and it says memcopy, the memory errors must not overlap, and they were overlapping. So um, we basically just changed to a mem move, and this fixed the bug. Uh, and this was discovered via reproducible builds, because we would build once, and we'd build again, and then we'd build again, and we'd see that there was this variation every time we built. And so the hashes, the checksums, weren't the same every time. And so therefore, we were like, there's some weird bug going on here. And so we managed to fix it, It's great. And uh, you also get some weird things, like um, here's a, um, as part of the build process of this um, random number gener ra sort of random text generator for tests. And in its own test suite, it would do a, um, U means generate a string of that, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, basically, the the, the um, every so often it would build and instead of generating a a text string which contained all three letters it would sometimes generate one with just two of those letters and you could calculate that using maths that that would happen 0.46 percent of the time and so um, we managed to fix this um, yeah yeah you get some weird things like that. Let me talk briefly about Debian and reproducible builds. Um, we have a we found those previous bugs in what we call well at least I call our sort of talk to test test environment. So this is where we build um, we have an A build and a B build, and we vary as much as possible deliberately between these two. And this is to flush out um, reproducible issues that we kind of know about concepts. So um, on the A build we might build with to in with the clock just set to today. And then on the B build, we'll, set, we'll have a system set up deliberately with the clock 18 months in the future. So anything that encodes the build time, the build year, et cetera, it will always vary between them. And so if the build process does encode those things, it will flag them up. Um, and then also changes between these environments include changing the host name, domain name. We have our own file system that deliberately returns things in a random order. Um, and so that flags up any build process that um, relies on the underlying file system ordering. We'd also change, we also change the time zone locale, the UID GID, all sorts of other nonsense, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, we did our first rebuild of the entire Debian archive in 2013, and 24%, not too bad. Um, and it, as of March 2018, we were at 93% when we rebuild of our packages are reproducible, um, it, using our talk-to-test framework and using some experimental um, cha changes. Um, this shows the graph of our progress over time. Um, that's 2015, things like that. Um, Green is, is the reproducible packages uh, by, by number, so higher is better. Um, and orange is the number of reproducible packages. You can kind of ignore the red and the black ones because they're you know, packages that fail to build, so they aren't really relevant here. I guess two things you can notice is that the total number of packages in Debian is going up. Not a surprise. Uh, we always add in more packages. Um, you'll also see that um, some spikes and some dips. Um, so for example, here is where we probably just screwed something up, so that can be ignored. Here is where we introduced a new variation into our torture test environment. Particularly, we introduced build path variation, where I, in the A build, we might build in you know, slash temp slash A, and in the B build, we might build in slash temp slash B. And this resulted in all packages that encoded that build path into the final binary would now go from being reproducible to 
I'm reproducible. In, yeah. Um, and then we you know, slowly started fixing them. And then here's a patch to um, GCC that we added, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Made a bunch of changes. So you can kind of see slow but steady progress to 100%, but still not there, as you can see from the variation. Yeah. You can see our current status at isdebianreproducibleyet.com, um, which is kind of one of those silly one page websites, like the how many people are in space. Um, but it just basically tells you how many, uh, what percentage of packages are reproducible in Debian right now. Whilst it started perhaps as a Debian ish related project, it's now way beyond Debian. So it's now a completely ag distribution agnostic um, uh, endeavor. We also don't necessarily care, concern ourselves only with distributions. So we have a whole bunch of compilers, a whole bunch of um, package managers. Um, and things like that, um, bootstrapping compilers and all sorts of other things as well. So anyone who's interested in, interested in reproducible builds as a general concept um, is, now, is now completely on board. We also have a whole bunch of other people using our testing framework. Um, so for example, we're now building Arch Linux packages, um, um, Core Boot, OpenWRT, um, who else, who else, Leads. Basically, using our talk to chest to flush out reproducible issues in our in our um, flush out reproducible issues in their own code, etc. We've also had two summits um, in one in Athens, one in Berlin, where, where we guess you basically get, get together for three days and without our laptops, work on issues about reproducible builds, try and work out what the next steps are, um, you know, try and uh, do some cross distribution. Um, collaboration, et cetera, et cetera. As part of this, we also have, as, uh, have created some tools that are useful. Um, here we, well, if you want to compare two binaries, um, you can, of, or compare any two files, you can use um, the normal Unix diff tool. So uh, I'm not sure that's visible here, but that says this is the first file, and then this, and then it says this is the second file. So um, if you just run diff on file one and file two, you get um, the differences between the files. This is great. But if you want to do that for binaries that you're producing from a compiler, you don't really end up with anything that's readable. So here are the result of running diff on two dot deb files. Okay. Yeah. Um, what are the differences? Uh, well, I'm not really sure. There's some sort of Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, not really what's going on. Yeah. So we should build a better diff, is what we thought. And so we did. And we called it Diffoscope. Um, and Diffoscope, well, yeah. Diffoscope will try and get to the bottom of what makes files or directories different. It will recursively unpack archives of many kinds and transform various binary formats into more hum human readable forms to compare them. Um, so, uh, particularly binary files and things like that. So. If you then compared these two DEBs again, it'll unpack them and it'll say, oh, um, yeah, so there's actual differences in the files inside the DEB. Um, inside here, there's, like a, there's inside this DEB, there's a file called control.tar.gz. Uh, and in there, also, there's a file called data. And in there, there's a data.tar.xz. And in that xz file, there's a data.tar. And inside that, in that tar file, there's a file called dfx.dat. And inside that, there's a difference, and it's just one byte change. So if you remember, when, oh, 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 that one byte change, that one byte of meaningful change, ended up with all this garbage here, uh, sort of because it's compressed. So you get sort of um, runaway changes, things like that. Um, what Diffoscope has managed to um, let me go the right way this time. What Diffoscope has managed to show is that it's basically just um, just one byte of meaningful change. And from this, you can say, well, if it's defx.dat, you can, in most cases, just go right to the source, search for defx.dat, work out why that is changing between there, and that turns a you know, 20-hour debugging session into basically a 20-second one where you're just like, oh, it's just adding a version for no reason. Cool. Uh, oh, that looks like a date. So yeah, it's adding the current date to it. Let's just ignore that. OK, great. Fixed. Done. Next. 
Um, you can also see that um, Diffiscope is showing different bits of metadata between the files. So um, gzip files, um, you can, in the headers, they can actually encode when it was actually, the original file was last modified in the header. And um, if that varies between the files, then of course your build will not be reproducible, et cetera, et cetera. And so Diffiscope will helpfully say, oh yeah, in the metadata for this file, in this particular cwl.gz, um, the last modified header in the metadata of that file, not the file itself, but the metadata, um, is different. And it's, and it's in this particular bit here there. So again, you can go from that all the way back to the source and say, oh, okay, brilliant, it's an easy way of fixing it. A Diffiscope also supports HTML output. Uh, so you, when you have these big nested trees, that becomes very useful because HTML is a bit nicer than this sort of text output there. And this screenshot also demonstrates how it supports many, many different file formats. So for example, here is me comparing two SQLite databases. Now normally, if you just run a diff on a SQLite database, it's going to come up with all sorts of binary nonsense that won't be very useful. But um, if you run Diffiscope on it, It'll run a dump of a SQL dump on this database and recreate the exact SQL commands that were used to generate it in the first place and then run the diff on that. So you can immediately tell that in the first, in test one, the SQL like three, it was created by someone adding um, the value one into the table test. And in the second file, test two.sqlite, um, someone added the value 2 into the same table. And so from that, you can always certainly go back to the original source and work out why someone's put 1 in there and 2 in there. Basically great. And then you don't get this big garbage of, of binary diff between the two. Um, also supports quite a few other four formats. Um, I won't read them because that would just be boring. Um, but it, some weird stuff as well. It's like it can compare open SSH public keys or... Um, uh, file systems or TCP dump capture files, you know, supports all sorts of bizarre um, file formats that you might want to run. You can also try it immediately online. There's a web-based version where um, you can just upload two files that are vaguely similar and uh, run Diffiscope on them and see what's going on. Um, it's very useful just for, you know, throwaway usages and you don't have to install any of the file format um, supports because on the some of these, for example, if you wanted to compare mono files, you might need to install the mono build environment, which would suck if you don't want to install that. So yeah, you can try it online, Diffiscope. Um, yeah. Um, so I'm using Diffiscope all the time for showing the differences in, for example, security uploads. Oh, sorry. Uh, so for example, these are under the banner of um, deliberate changes to code. So for example, if the security vulnerability was that it said if blah instead of if not blah, and I just want to change that, um, I'll make that change and then run Diffiscope on the previous vulnerable binary and run Diffiscope on the hopefully fixed binary and I should only see that change between those two files, which is great because then I can rely on it um, not changing any other, other stuff at the same time. Um, just to highlight that Diffiscope is not the definition of reproducible, um, it's just a way of comparing binaries. So that's often a, a source of confusion that, oh, if I run Diffiscope, does that mean it's reproducible? It's like, well, no, it's just a, it's just a better diff, just to you know, save you time. Um, I also use Diffiscope on binary blobs, so um, a bunch of um, unnamed router, um, etc. will just throw a whole bunch of, oh, here's a new firmware you should install on your new router device. Well, it's all free software, but great. I want to actually compare that with the previous one. Throw that at Diffiscope and it'll say, yep, the differences are here, 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 and here. Quite interesting. Great. So what's left to do in the reproducible build space? So um, the source code it still remains vulnerable. So if there are actual bugs, uh, omissions, um, bad um, backdoors, etc., that have been introduced into the original source code, a reproducible build won't help you. So if someone's managed to sneak in to your upstream Git repository a backdoor or a bug or anything, a reproducible build won't help you because you just basically everyone's going to end up with the same vulnerable bit of source code. 
or if it uses weak algorithms, if it, the security algorithm is just dodgy or you know, uses a deprecated hash function, et cetera, et cetera, um, then a reproducible build won't magically bless it with magical security properties. Yeah. Um, if your code has a testing mode, for example, um, uh, made famous by a certain German vehicle manufacturer, um, if, if it runs under testing mode where it has different results, if you ended up with the same source code, so if you start with the same source code, that's not really going to help you, and reproducible builds won't necessarily help you in this case. It will only help you if um, uh, Volkswagen were providing binaries to someone and then providing different binaries to someone else and also providing the source code. Um, and you better compare the two by using reproducible builds. The other issue is how to do, how to explain this concept to, to end users. So you could go through the story, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But when they go to install something, if a piece of software is not reproducible, how should that be exposed? I mean, do they care? Should they care? Uh, so, for example, this is this is not in apt right now, but there is code to do it. Um, these following packages are not reproducible. Do you want to install them anyway? Well, th this works in a sense, but I'm not sure that's very meaningful for end users. Um, and will they just hit and end up hitting yes? Because, you know, yeah, kind of sucks. Or do they hit no and not install the software? It's all a bit like, it's just not a great interface. So having this actually meaningful to end users um, is another step that needs to be done. So anyway, um, yeah, there are other changes to, to be done. Uh, we still need to do quite a bit of work on tool chains. Um, there are, we still need to get our patch to GCC merged. Uh, Golang currently has issues with build path variation. Um, I think the same with the R statistical database and things like that. And there's a whole bunch of other tool chains as well that suffer a lot. Um, making changes to tool chains is obviously great because if you fix um, a problem that's being introduced to a lot of packages at once via fixing the tool chain. Um, fixing that problem means that you immediately make a whole um, swathe of packages and software reproducible, which is great. Um, in Debian, there's a large number of infrastructure changes that need to be done um, to support reproducible builds and to support some of the metadata that goes around them. We also need to continue to improve our metadata and developer tools. Uh, so, for example, Diffiscope and things like that. Oh, I'm being... I mean, time? Yep. Okay, thank you. Uh, nearly at the end, so, yeah, great. Uh, so, Diffiscope could still use support for more um, file formats um, and things like that. And uh, there's also perhaps some policy changes that could be made. So, we could, for example, solve the, um, the user interface problem by just saying, by definition, all Debian packages must be reproducible. And um, if they aren't, then they aren't in the archive. So no user would see this because it just wouldn't exist. There wouldn't be such a thing as an unreproducible package, so therefore. So these are questions and things to be still be done. And also, we can start to use reproducible builds to attack some age-old problems in computer science, like trusting trust, which is kind of a, a nice um, thing to read on Wikipedia one day and to get very worried about, about compilers, things like that. Anyway, get involved. Um, visit our website, re reproduciblebuilds.org. Uh, follow us, reproducibles on Twitter, etc. Join us on, on um, IRC. Uh, we're starting to starting to restart our IRC meetings, but we're pretty friendly folk. Um, so just come in, hang out. Good, good stuff. So yeah, um, thank you, Shen. And if I've got any questions, maybe we'll. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. But we run or we overtook our time slot, so ah, we okay. would uh, postpone the questions to maybe the lunchtime uh, or some uh, more personal conversations uh, during the conference in the sponsors area, for instance. Um, but thanks anyway for the presentation, and uh, our next talk will be about Labyrinth.